So why don't we uh, move forward here and uh, so so here we can see the patient had prior surgery. This was an open surgery from a number of years ago, and we can see a repeat tear, I mean a recurrent tear, and clearly we can see that there's proximal retraction of the muscular tendinous junction, full thickness tear with retraction of the supraspinatus tendon and fluid going through the tear. So this is clearly uh, a post-op tear. Now, if you have a, a, a tear that really can't be reconstructed, and these are typically more chronic tears, very large tears, tears we have scarring in the muscle so that the muscle is not pliable enough to pull back over it without having too much tension on it, uh, then uh, there, there are techniques that we talked a little bit about the other days where you can, some of these are called graft jackets, they have a, a number of different names that the, the, the different manufacturers have, but you basically can put in uh, tissue, viable tissue, suture it in just as a cover uh, to help uh, decrease the bone-on-bone uh, -bone interaction between the uh, humeral head and the acromion. Uh, John, do you have a comment about uh, these kind of techniques? Um, well, uh, like I said earlier, uh, most of the surgery is done for pain. Um, and uh, the function uh, usually is uh, fairly decent, even with um, considerable uh, tears as large as three centimeters. Um, but the pain is what, what gets these folks to, uh, to surgery uh, for the most part. Yeah. Of course, athletes, um, uh, that's uh, obviously important. But um, in, in average individuals, uh, the pain can get so bad that you cannot abduct the arm at all and you cannot circumduct. So um, they come to surgery like a lot of golfers uh, experience this. Uh, I have tears on probably both my shoulders, but I put up with the next exercise. Anyway, uh, there are slides that you can do, uh, what they call a slide. You take the uh, a tendon, uh, uh, like the uh, supraspinatus, and then and, 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 and slide the infraspinatus um, adjacent to it, uh, uh, into the lateral position. There are kind of tricks to doing that. But when it comes to a chronic tear like what you're showing here, um, and, and you're, you're using uh, graft material, that's mainly to cover for pain for function. This is not a functional repair. Yeah, good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Let's see. 40 year female with uh, post op for cuff repair with and bi biceps tendesis with three months of increasing pain. Uh, it looks like a PD fat set, axiom image. Uh, I see post op repair of the uh, suture anchors in the humeral head, and uh, it looks like, uh, um, yeah, it looks like a, the uh, basically the greater, I mean, less of tuberosity, there's some increased signal. Uh, there might be, uh, and the I mean, first thing I think is maybe there may be some partial avulsion uh, injury, but uh, it's, it's, this scapular ten, oh, tendon does, doesn't look. Hmm. I mean, there's some there's some increase. Actually, what I okay, so within the bicipital groove, I I mean uh, there is. Uh, I mean, I could. I was gonna say maybe there there's some signal. That, I mean, there's a signal, a high intense signal in there. Uh, I can't tell. I mean, it just says biceps, biceps tenodesis. Um, you know, I mean, okay. it looks like. So, so, so what we see here, here's the subscapular yeah. theres muscle and tendon attaching to the lesser tuberosity. We really don't see the biceps very well in here, but we can see some postoperative change next to the bicepal groove. We can partial yeah. volume of a, of a post-op change back here with probably a suture anchor placement. Here's uh, the infraspinatus and maybe a portion of the teres minor tendon here with some fluid next to it. But what do we have out there? Uh, okay, so I mean, there is this area of relatively hyperintense signal. Uh, it might be uh, it might be some uh, fluid collection, possibly, or some hemorrhage. Uh, I mean, okay, so granulation this, tissue. This is the deltoid muscle yeah. here, 
it comes all the way around, so it looks like we have some edema within the deltoid muscle and a loss of the normal anatomic features within the muscle that we see posteriorly there. And uh, this was denervation atrophy of the deltoid muscle. And the, uh, the deltoid is an important muscle for function of the shoulder. It's actually important for abduction of the shoulder, especially if you have an abnormal rotator cuff. So having a uh, lack of function of the deltoid in the presence of rotator cuff repair uh, can actually lead to a lot of dysfunction and pain. So this is just to remind you to be sure and look for the deltoid muscle. Uh, more commonly, we'll see focal atrophy, which is what you would see a few months later. Uh, but this is uh, kind of acute denervation of the, uh, the deltoid, and it's, a, it's an important finding when you see it. Uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Sure. So we've got uh, pain and weakness after uh, four prior surgeries. Um, we've got uh, coronal images uh, for this uh, post-operative uh, shoulder. Um, and, you know, the first thing that's catching me is we're seeing, let me go with the last case, um, a lot of, uh, I guess, atrophy of the deltoids here. Um, well, well, it looks like we've got a big deltoid here, but the problem yeah. has to do with the, uh, the deltoid typically goes out and actually the there may be a little tendon, but a lot of times the deltoid the muscles fibers will actually go all the way to the acromion process. And we're seeing here there's really a marked displacement of the deltoid origin here. And, uh, and then we see what looks like a thin fibrous tissue there where we should, should see deltoid muscle. Here's what the, here are the, the axial images. So you can see uh, really a loss of the deltoid muscle all in through here. And this was a deltoid dehiscence, which is a major problem. John, do you want to talk about the deltoid? Uh, that's a very important muscle, as you as you mentioned. Uh, most of the surgery uh, open is done through the deltopectoral groove, and you don't go more than two inches below the uh, chromial process. Uh, that that uh, when you get uh, below. Uh, 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 Two inches, you you you've got problems on your hands. Uh, that's the axillary nerve. So now, as far as detaching, but um, uh, you can detach the um, deltoid from the chromial process or from the um, uh, part of the clavicle. Sometimes it goes that far. Um, but uh, once you do that, the problem is uh, putting the sutures in and trying to reattach it. So, if you can take a little sliver of, of bone and, and only the tendinous portion, very, very carefully, you can reattach it. But if you're a little careless and a patient uh, doesn't uh, cooperate too well or you don't immobilize the patient too well for three weeks, he'll de his. So, uh, then, uh, post operatively, you have to be very careful on, 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 on these kind of patients. And besides that, there are other problems with the shoulder as well as. I'm sure you'll mention. Yeah, well, yeah, I, I want to just primarily just focus on the on the deltoid dehiscence. And how easy are these to treat, John? Uh, they're not, not easy. Uh, you can't grab the muscle and pull it up. Um, you have to have a tendon to, uh, to suture. Uh, uh, if you suture the muscle uh, longitudinally, um, the, the, the suture is, is like, a, they're like knives. They'll, they'll tear right through the tissue. So um, if you, uh, to take a string uh, or a fish line and, 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 and um, pull that across your finger, you can cut yourself. Uh, that's the same thing with what happens in surgery when you're, when you're suturing. You make it too tight, uh, it'll just rip right through, um, just like a knife would. So ten tendons, you can suture. But muscles, uh, you cannot, unless it's side to side, and then that repair is, um, is just to kind of uh, try to close uh, a, a wound. Yeah. So we don't see this very often anymore. This, this was something that was a dreaded complication back with open surgeries. And one of the main advantages of arthroscopy is that the dehiscence of the deltoid is pretty much... Uh, not seen in arthroscopic procedures. 
Well, uh, the, the thing is, uh, you cannot do all the procedures uh, to stop so there, um, like for instance, if you have a massive tear, you're better off doing arthroscopic procedure on the infraspinatus and teres minor. Uh, but but uh, the supraspinatus, um, at the same time, you, you, you in the subscapularis, uh, you do an open procedure uh, because it's far more easy to do. And you don't want to spend 12 hours doing the surgery. So you have to combine the procedures. And, and this is the fourth attempt at surgery. Uh, and maybe that's the reason why it, there's a problem, because it was uh, maybe done all that arthroscopically. And, 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 and then uh, the, the second two operations probably uh, uh, cut the tendon from its insertion. In other words, the, uh, the deltoid, and, and, and they probably the the essence is because it's just uh, tore through the tissue. Yeah, the, I, the, so I guess the sutures tore through the tissue. It can only really happen when there's actually an, a primary like cut that the surgeon did through the entire deltoid. Only open procedures. John, did you hear the question? I, I didn't hear that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So, does this process occur only when there's been an, uh, a, a surgeon that actually went in there and cut the entire tendon or the, cut the entire muscle origin off? Or can this happen uh, in an arthroscopic case? Uh, I, I'm not seeing that, that uh, arthroscopically. Arthroscopically, what happens is that, that actually a nerve sometimes gets. Uh, into trouble if, if uh, because when you put in your initial uh, stab wounds, uh, you're you're kind of doing a line, and then and, and you can catch the nerve. Okay. Uh, that 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 can happen, um, and then of course when you do open surgery, you can cut your tooth. So that's why I said you, you don't want to go more than two inches below uh, uh, the chromium process. And and then, uh, but this here, how uh, did happen here is they actually uh, detached the, the, the deltoid because with all the scar tissue there, they couldn't um, get the vis visualization of the joint and what they had to do. And um, so it is uh, that the, the, the sutures just cut out of the, of the muscle. So the deltoid dehiscence is really something that's primarily just seen in open surgeries, but uh, right. But uh, yeah, anything can happen in medicine. So never say never. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, in the old days, um, they used to uh, do a, a, a saber cut. Uh, where, where they went right through the, the deltoid um, and, uh, and through the chromial process. And then, uh, then they used screws to put that chromial process back. Also, they used to take the chromium off and reattach the deltoid. And then, of course, you know what happens after that. Uh, so that was all uh, forgotten. They used to actually split the chromial process um, Longitudinally in a uh, in a cork, cork, um, um, cork. Corkoid. Oh, jeez. Coracoid. In the uh, <laughs> the coracoid process. I uh, know they split the chromion um, in the in the not not the sagittal plane but the coronal plane. Um, I already, you know, I just woke up a little while ago, so I'm kind of sleepy. Next case. This is an 84-year-old female with chronic pain, rule out rotator the cuff tear. We got a chronal, looks like a T2 and a PDFS, fat sat. Um, we have what it looks like a massive rotator the cuff tear uh, with retraction of the tendon uh, medially. Um, and uh, in terms of like, del uh, yeah, so there is like a 
area of low signal in the supraglenoid notch. I'm sorry, this uh, supraglenoid um, uh, space or region, um, which could be the tendon stump um, that's been torn and retracted. And then I guess the deltoid is also is kind of like displaced inferiorly. So it's, so it's also the Primarily, you can get cases that are complex, and you can look at all the rotator cuff stuff, uh, but you don't want to miss the deltoid. So you, you need to kind of make a point, uh, especially if the case is more complex, uh, to not forget to always look at the deltoid, because uh, surgeons can get very upset if you talk about a lot of things, but you forget to mention the fact that you have a dehiscence and displacement of the deltoid, because that's an important finding. And here we can see the complete loss of the deltoid here, fluid going through the deltoid, te tear out into the surrounding soft tissues. So, okay, uh, shall I? Okay, so we have two axial images, a uh, T1 and a T2, and there's a suture anchor within the humerus with uh, surrounding fluid signal within the bone and also bone marrow edema. And so then we have uh, sagittal and coronal. Are these post arthrogram images? So, so this is another suture. Okay. okay uh, uh, Jeff, what do you think of this case? Uh, so uh, post operative complications that we're looking at now. Okay. Uh, sagittal. Uh, T1 and, and I don't know, T, uh, P fat sat. Uh, it looks like uh, there's a round uh, foreign body uh, uh, in the area of the supraspinatus. Uh, it looks like uh, what we have is, uh, and essentially, yeah, there's a, a scar, or just basically the tunnel for the uh, anchor, suture anchor there uh, in the humeral head. And uh, it's a, there's a significant defect uh, with uh, throwing edema. So I think it's a thing, yeah, we're seeing a, basically a suture anchor uh, that is in cross section and has been yeah. and so, pulled so, away. So, so yeah. this one is the suture anchor has been pulled out, and we can see a lot yeah. of damage to the bone where the suture anchor was. Yeah. So this the, obviously. Uh, the, uh, one area, uh, if you're going to go. Uh, there, there have been. I think they had two anchors here. Yes, and, uh, one, one, one below here and one there. Yeah. Now one there. Uh, the lower one doesn't belong there. Yes. Uh, that's an unusual because you're you're um, you pull the anchor into the um, foot plate, and that's way below the foot plate. I think this was a double row technique, John, and they had one here at the at the at the uh, uh, foot plate, and they had another one out here where the sutures went out and grabbed the tendon uh, to uh, to be the second row. And well, no, the, sec the double row, you still have to be in a foot plate. Your lateral your lateral margin of the foot plate, not below the greater tuberosity that. You cannot put sutures out there that long that they'll they'll tear. Well, this one tore. Uh, obviously, yeah. yeah. And for uh, for for a reason because it, it's it's not the right place for it. Yeah. Jonah. All right. So we've got uh, two coronal images of uh, shoulder here. Um, we're seeing some sort of um, kind of low signal. Um, Structure inferiorly. Um, fortunately, let's see. So I'd want to see. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, sorry. I can't see your pointer, but yeah, that's the uh, structure I'm referring to now. Um, you know, depending. Okay, yeah. So probably a loose anchor. So this is a loose anchor. This is another mm -hmm. anchor that was pulled out, and this this time it's loose within the joint space. Mm -hmm. Got a 63-year-old man with shoulder pain after surgery. Um, you have a chrono, looks like a T1, T2, and PDFS, if I'm not mistaken. Again, we see a suture that's been um, 
suture anchor fractured or fragmented and is displaced medially from its insertion point. And uh, we have this chrono, yeah, basically on the axial images again it shows that it's been displaced superiorly into the superior glenoid joint, two of them. Um, again, a failed. Yeah. Okay, so we have chronal axial um, T1 weighted images, and there's uh, an area of low signal intensity adjacent to the humeral head um, within the region of the supraspinatus, just thicker than usual, I suspect. Um, and on the radiograph, this correlates with calcific tendinosis or tendinitis. Yeah, I, the, the term for this is you know, many people use is calcific tendinitis. The, <clears throat> what you have is really deposition of calcium pyrophosphate uh, in the in the soft tissues. You may or may not have edema around it or inflammatory changes around it. That that's very variable. Uh, <clears throat> But the edema tends to correlate well with symptoms. If you don't have a lot, lot of edema, you tend to have less symptoms than when you have a lot of edema. And when you have a lot of edema, it probably is tendonitis. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the cause of these is pretty much debated. It probably has to do with dystrophic calcification when you have partial tears. Uh, you develop a... a, a, a environment in the tendon that leads to deposition of uh, calcium and pyrophosphate uh, in the tendons. Uh, the edema around it may be an inflammatory reaction to the calcium phosphate deposition, or it may be a, an adjacent tear associated with it, in which case that, that may be the symptom. So uh, just because you have calcium doesn't really mean that you have an inflammatory change there. And uh, there are people who can have a lot of calcium who don't have symptoms. Uh, but if you have a lot of edema, the patients typically have symptoms. Yes. Um, I, 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 being enough experts, of course, we don't see it, more do we? But anyway, uh, I, I, I used to have an extra unit, uh, and uh, sometimes I had Dalrymple's folks come over and uh, use my machines, but. Uh, uh, what, what, what I found interesting in shoulders is that I saw uh, probably hundreds of shoulders with uh, calcium, uh, uh, bits of calcium around them, and, and yet they were asymptomatic. It wasn't the calcium, it was some other problem that they came to see me about. Uh, so it's, it's and, and you know, when you take uh, x rays of the neck, uh, I mean, not, not the neck, but the chest. Sometimes you'll see uh, calcium deposits. Um, so it's, it's a very, very common condition, but uh, uh, yet the symptomatic ones, like you say, John, are, are uh, uh, cause edema and inflammatory could, uh, changes, and it are very, very painful, extremely painful. Uh, uh, I think you're going to tell us about that. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I guess I have two questions. One, how often do you see this without edema surrounding the tendon? Uh, it's more common without edema. Without edema? Okay. And then when you see it without edema, do you just say that there's calcium deposition in this location, or do you say calcific yeah. tendonitis? Well, uh, <coughs> describe it, say it's compatible with ca uh, calcium deposition, and I call it calcific tendon tendinosis. That's what I usually use as the term. Unless there's a lot of edema around it, then I say it's calcific tendonitis or calcium associated with a partial tear, depending on what it looks like. Okay, So you can get different kinds of calcium deposition into the tissues. Uh, CPPD tends to be uh, calcium pyrophosphate. That tends to be more in the cartilage with chondrocalcinosis. And uh, uh, this actually can produce an inflammatory reaction, uh, which, as you all know, is often called pseudogout. Uh, uh, you can also get chondrocalcinosis, which is typically a different biochemical mixture uh, where you can get calcium calcifications into 
uh, fibrous tissue, very common in the menisci. In fact, most adults histologically will have a lot of calcium deposits in their menisci that we don't see by either MR or by, by X-ray techniques. Uh, so uh, there, there are different ways, and, and there are different kind of mechanisms which go, go through this. Uh, the, the main thing is that uh, when you see this, it's probably associated with an injury to the tendon. Uh, now, uh, most of the time, this is more of a milk of calcium rather than a, it's not an ossicle. And therefore, one of the treatments is to go in uh, with a needle and try to, uh, to aspirate it. It's very unclear to me in the literature. Uh, there's a lot of anecdotal cases of people getting less sympt symptomatic. And typically, when you do that, you, you put in steroids and, and anesthesia. And there are uh, anecdotal reports that people get better uh, if, if you do that. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, with MRI, and most of the patients that I've seen with this, when we followed them up, they have not gotten any procedures, and they also tend to get better within several days. Uh, so, and uh, I, I've known several people, in fact, my wife uh, had this condition, and it's, it can be very variable if you follow people over time. They can have a lot of calcium one week, three weeks later, the amount of calcium can be much less. And... Uh, it can be very variable. Sometimes the calcium can completely go away in a few weeks. Sometimes it can stay for several years. So it, it, it's very variable. Uh, uh, but if people have persistent symptoms, one of the treatments is to aspirate it. So it's funny. We've had several wives of radiologists uh, who have had this condition and been symptomatic and uh, in RADNET, and all of them to a person have refused to have needling that. So anyway, and they, they've all recovered. So again, the mechanism is uncertain, and uh, there are different calcifications. We don't need to do it here. If you aspirate it, you can see the uh, calcium phosphate crystals uh, layering in the fluid. Uh, the, 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 I've treated uh, many, many cases of uh, uh, calcific tendonitis uh, or Anyway, calcium deposits that were very painful in the shoulder and other areas. And uh, the, the, the idea is to needle the area so that you kind of, uh, sometimes you can aspirate the calcium, but uh, the calcium can be uh, very uh, milky or it can be uh, quite firm like toothpaste or even uh, sometimes almost like chalk, uh, which is almost like bone. Uh, so the idea is uh, you, you don't always, if you're doing a procedure blind just by the touch of your uh, thumb and whatever, um, then what you do is you needle and needle and needle the, the area after, of course, an anesthetic, a local anesthetic, and then you put cortisone in, injection into the area. And um, I, I don't think I missed too many because I usually cured the patient within one shot. And they're very, very grateful people because the pain is gone almost yeah. instantly. It's great. I, mean, it is, I don't see any reason for people to suffer for a, a week or two uh, because the pain is excruciating. So you've had really good luck of aspirating it. I, I've had extremely good luck. Great. I, I didn't uh, x-ray the patients afterwards uh, to, to see whether the calcium disappeared or not. Okay. I, I never I never did that, so. But the pain was gone, so why bother? Good. Jeff, what do you think about this case? Uh, coronal uh, PD and PD facet images. Uh, we have multiple uh, hypo intense uh, structures. Uh, looks like they are uh, superficial to the supersonatus uh, tendon, uh, and uh, these uh, we correlate with radiograph, but uh, certainly uh, uh, looks like a calcific uh, tendinosis. Yeah. Uh, so, so it really looks yeah. like in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and that's uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Jonah. Okay, so we've got a 57-year-old with intermittent shoulder pain uh, several years after a uh, body surfing injury, uh, but then 48 hours of uh, acute intense pain uh, after yoga. So yeah, we've got. Uh, 
multiple series uh, chrono through the uh, shoulder. We're seeing this um, kind of uh, round, irregular, um, hypo-intense on all uh, series uh, structure um, with uh, associated um, edema signal. Um, so certainly we'd entertain the possibility of uh, calcific tendonitis again. Yeah, so and, uh, that's what we have here. And we can see a lot of edema associated with it, really going out into the deltoid muscle. <clears throat> and in this particular case, it was after yoga. I, I think she had a little bit of a muscle tear adjacent to this area of calcific uh, d deposits, uh, primarily here in the, in the subscapularis. Here we can see it anteriorly here. Uh, <clears throat> so this was on 4509. And then uh, the, the symptoms improved on... Uh, uh, NSAIDs, she refused to, to have it aspirated, uh, even though that's what we recommended. And uh, this is 14 months later, she'd been asymptomatic for, for quite a while, and we can see uh, that it's completely gone uh, later. She was, she actually, she became asymptomatic about a month after the original event completely, so my guess is if we'd done the MR earlier, it would have been, we would have found that the calcium was gone uh, much more than a year and a year later. Okay, uh, Dan. <clears throat> we got a frontal radiograph of the right shoulder and two, it looks like, um, if I'm not mistaken, chronal? Is it axial? It's chronal. It's axial. Axial, okay. I don't know. Uh, axial? Okay, on the radiograph, it looks like chronos. chronos. Um, uh, it looks like there is a Calcification in the um, superior aspect of the humeral head, compatible with calcific. I mean, superior to the humeral head. Yeah, um, compatible with calcific analysis that we see on the MR findings with the area of low signal, um, and this actually is causing. I'm not sure. It's a little bit of remodeling of the adjacent bone or erosion. calcium deposits, if they're adjacent to the bone, you can actually get an erosion of the bone. In this particular case, you can see there's extensive bone marrow edema associated with, with this erosion. And these tend to all be very symptomatic. And uh, since this is, this is really not a bone, it, 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 this is really more of a milk of calcium in here, it's probably an, inf an adjacent inflammatory response which does the erosion of the bone, not, not really a mechanical. And here's just another example on a low field scanner where we can see calcium deposit right adjacent to where we see this large erosion extending into the bone. So this is, quote, calcific tendonitis uh, with associated bone erosions, which is also not uncommon. Sorry, I had a question about one of the cases, like a few, a few patients ago, um, there was uh, low signal deposits within the bursa, subchromial subdeltoid bursa. Yeah, that one. Would you also include synovial chondromatosis here? Uh, yes. Okay. So it could be either of those things? Uh, yes. Okay. And then, but with follow-up, if it was synovial chondromatosis, it would not resolve versus the calcific tendosis would resolve. Okay. Uh, sometimes if, uh, when, when you have a bursal uh, calcium deposit, like um, you see here, uh, in the bursa, uh, you can't always needle that out and uh, you know get rid of the symptoms. Sometimes you have to make a small incision and uh, just uh, rem rem remove the calcium. Um, all you need is about a, an inch incision and uh, laterally and uh, take that out. So okay. wash the wash the calcium out of there. Yeah, and occasionally. Okay, these look very discreet, so they could be uh, uh, little bone areas. But usually, you'll when it's chronic like this, you'll see fat in it if, if these are really, really ossicles. So this would still go along mostly with calcific tendonitis. Okay. Uh, if, uh, if if that went on for a long time, uh, probably it would become bald. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Okay, let's see. Who's next? Okay. 
Here's a safety arthrogram looking for a rotator cuff tear. Okay, so we have uh, coronal, axial, and sagittal images, and there's contrast that ex that is extending superiorly um, from the articular surface into the supraspinatus tendon. Um, Where is that? Are you talking about this? Distally, yeah. Um, so there's a tear there. Um, but it doesn't communicate with the subacromial uh, or subdeltoid bursa extensively. But then on the MRI, there's on the coronal T1, there's low signal intensity in that same spot. Um, so, what could it be? Um, do we have the x ray? Okay. <laughs> this is calcium, uh, not contrast. Not contrast, yeah. Jeff, what do you think of this case? Okay, seven-year female, severe shoulder pain, and we have the uh, T1 coronal uh, images here. So it looks like in the uh, uh, in the right, particularly, again, we see an area of uh, hypo-intense signal uh, in the supraspinatus tendon. Uh, this could be this present. I don't see much too much edema uh, within uh, it. So the superior surface here looks very abnormal. It looks like it's thickened, and the margins okay. of the superior surface are, are very indistinct. Yet we can see the low signal here, and here's the PD. Okay, fat side. Uh, PD fat side. There's certainly there is a, a hyperintense signal in that same area as describes period superficial to the uh, uh, all through there. I would guess maybe even extending down into the bursa out here. So this could represent, uh, you know. Uh, Calcific tendonitis, uh, given those, uh, well, we take a look at the you're the same ray to evaluate. You're the same uh, is it again, we see indistinctness of that superior margin. And then what do we see over here on the more medially? Uh, more medially, it looks like uh, within the muscle belly itself uh, of the supraspinatus, uh, there's this significant edema as well. And, Here's it. And CT scan. So in the CT, it looks like in the supraspinatus, uh, we're seeing uh, essentially, uh, you know, calcific uh, deposits uh, that extend all along the, uh, the entire surface, or a significant portion of the surface of supraspinatus. Uh, so I think that's what we're seeing on those uh, sagittal images there. Probably within the. Uh, so so what's going on here? What is all this? Uh, so. Uh, I mean, given the CT findings, I mean, in this hypo-intense signal, I think it's calcific uh, deposition, and I think, uh, you know, certainly compatible with a, you know, a, a very pronounced calcific tendonitis extending through the, um, not only just involving the, uh, you know, supraspinatus tendon, but also involving the belly itself. Right. So this is the, uh, the most extensive case that I've seen. Yeah. Okay. And that, that, that's quite the fuse. Uh, and, and uh, that, that one, I, I, I'd have a hard time treating this. Yeah. Uh, this one, I think I'd use pain pills. <laughs> okay. uh, Jonah, what do you think of this case? Okay, so here's a 45-year-old lady with uh, shoulder pain and no history of trauma. We've got a, a simple radiograph of her shoulder, and we're seeing this uh, sort of uh, irregular oval uh, calcific uh, density projecting uh, over the sort of a supralateral aspect there of the femoral uh, head. Here's her MR, and we've got an arrow sign. Uh, so we have some underlying uh, bone marrow edema in that location. Um, and we've got at least some... Uh, yeah, a lot of bone marrow edema here. And it looks like mm -hmm. we have an erosion of the, of the cortex there, right at the attachment, right at the foot plate attachment of the supraspinatus. Here going further, we can see Postoperatively, we, I mean, we post contrast, we have a significant amount of enhancement. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing uh, probably a lot of disease there. Mm -hmm. uh, so th th this turned out, this part here turned out to be an enchondroma. And mm -hmm. uh, the, that little erosion was all due to calcific tendonitis. So in this case, you had two things together. So. See, if you look back here, you can actually see the typical calcification pattern of an enchondroma. 
and it just shows how it's easy to miss very big lesions if there's something more obvious that you're looking at here. Definitely. So, so this was all in chondroma, and this was erosive calcific tendonitis. Uh, they gave contrast because they were wanted to evaluate uh, this lesion. Okay. Uh, Got an anterior shoulder pain with MR arthrogram. So we have two axial. It looks like a T1 fat set. Uh, or or T2, just T1. Oh, okay. Um, the abnormality is actually the, it looks like the subscap tendon is thickened. Um, uh, and then also, there's this, uh, increased signal within, uh, yeah, it's kind of linear. So, uh, it's bright on this T1, so it could be just fat within the tendon, I don't know, bone. bone. So, so this, this patient has arthrogram. arthrogram, right? And these are looks like uh, again it's T two fat set. I'm not sure. This, this is an arthrogram. Arthur, yeah. Okay. So if we go back here, uh, this this one one approach to the arthrography is actually stick the needle through the subscapula. Oh, I see. So that's just a contrast that's, so that was contrast from injection, okay. And then down here we can actually see that the labrum is out. So right. there's a, a labral tear there. And there we can see a little bit of abnormal circumstances with the tendon. And this, the tendon was off from the injection. From the injection, okay. So, uh, that didn't cure the patient. Uh, and then, yeah, that's right. Uh, anterior shoulder pain, so you have uh, axial and coronal T2-weighted images. Um, and so on the coronal image, there's increased signal intensity in the myotendinous junction of the subscapularis tendon, some partial thickness tearing of the intrasubstance of the subscapularis tendon as well. There's... Um, Okay. And this is primarily a musculotendinous junction tear. And you can see these in young athletes. They're extremely uncommon in adult and, uh, and people over the age of 25 or 30. Once so you get the age 25 or 30, the weak link is almost always the tendon, which is a little bit damaged here. But the main issue here, and this is an athlete, you can see the massive uh, muscular hypertrophy. And this is a typical location of tears in young athletes at the musculotendinous junction. Here's a patient who had uh, anterior shoulder pain, and we can just see a little partial tear within the more distal subscapularis tendon in that location. Uh, let's see. What do you think of this case, uh, Jeff? All right, uh, so we have... Uh, also had anterior shoulder pain. Okay, uh, looks like a... Basically, it looks like a post-arthrogram injection yep. to me, uh, and uh, so it's, you know, sagittal axial images. And uh, in the region of subscapularis, uh, let's see, it looks like uh, on the axial image, uh, it looks like there's a hyperintense signal within the uh, intra-substance of the subscapularis. I'm thinking there's an interstitial tear yeah. uh, there in the subscapularis. So this is, then, notice this has yeah. a different configuration than the one that Dan had. The one that Dan had went right through where the needle track was. This is increased signal intensity that's really going along the course of the tendon fibers, which is not the tract of the, of the needle. And this was a partial tear of the subscapularis. Okay, uh, Jonah, what did you think of this case? All right, so uh, we've got, uh, I guess, PD fat sat of uh, axial of this uh, patient's shoulder here. Uh, we're seeing some uh, signal abnormality along the uh, subscap with actually some cortical irregularity perhaps um, as we get uh, towards this insertion, yep. So I'd be concerned that this is, yep. So this is a partial tear of the deep fibers and this erosion is actually due to, histologically these are kind of 
microscopic fractures which occur, and this is really an avulsion injury of the deep fibers, uh, and it uh, injures the bone here. This is, this is actually very common even without seeing the tear in the tendon. As you all know, we see it in most adult patients at the infraspinatus insertion posteriorly here, but it's also fairly common in the subscapularis insertion anteriorly, and not that uncommon with the supraspinatus insertion, uh, but these are, are tears. When we see these in young athletes, they tend to start here on the joint side surface, but if they continue to do their athletic activity with kind of an acute uh, partial tear here, uh, we've seen a number of them become complete tears. So it's a little bit of a warning sign. And here we can see uh, thickening. Now here we have marked thickening of the, uh, the capsule. Now the, the transverse ligament here that helps hold the biceps tendon in place are actually continuations of fibers of the uh, 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 joint side surface or the bursal, I'm sorry, the bursal side surface of the subscapularis uh, uh, tendon. And here we can see it's markedly thickened and abnormal. And then we can see this big effusion and the subacromial subdeltoid uh, bursa. And this is a, a tear of that transverse ligament. Something with the anterior labrum or Yeah, the anterior labrum is abnormal here too. Okay, uh, next. Okay, we have another orthogram, um, axial images. Uh, it looks like, again, we have um, um, signal, uh, increased signal, longitudinal signal within the subscapularis tendon compatible with interstitial tear and also erosive changes of the subscap and also maybe infraspinatus on the other side. Axial images of the shoulder and uh, uh, arthrogram, post-arthrogram. And uh, so these are the T2 and T1. Okay. Okay. Um, so the subscapularis tendon looks like it's completely torn and retracted with fluid between. Muscle, it, uh, muscle tendon junction is very, very immediately placed. You can see a complete disruption uh, of the tendon there. And so this is a Jeff, what do you think of this one? This is 13-year-old male said, so I suppose, a, a football injury. Uh, looks like a T, what, T1 and, uh, I don't know. Yeah. I think this T2. is a T2 oh, and a PT fat set. Okay, T2 and PT fat set, thank you. Uh, so, uh, looking at, mm, that's with football injury. Let's get where it is. Uh, okay, so, I mean, certainly, okay, it looks like uh, on this axo images here, this, uh, uh, that looking at this uh, subscapularis tendon, the distal tendon, this having a regular morphology, um, and this significant amount of edema uh, at the, uh, at the uh, lesser tuberosity. Yeah, so we see now, edema here in the bone. So I'm wondering if there's a, an avulsion injury of the, uh, possibly, uh, of the uh, subscapularis tendon uh, at, that, uh, at its insertion on the lesser tuberosity. Um, yeah. So, so yeah. this is actually a sliver of bone, the cortex, which is pulled off, and this is all trabecular injury. And just like you said, this was a, a minimally displaced avulsive injury of this subscap in, insertion on the lesser tuberosity. Good. Jonah, what do you think of this case? Okay, so we've got uh, two axial images of uh, this patient's shoulder, and it seems as though um, you know, we've got a lot of signal abnormality of uh, subscap, and then we've got uh, some regularity to the uh, subsuperosity, a little bit of signal there. And then there's this sort of uh, rounded little hypo intense piece as well, yep. And yeah, actually, I guess this uh, perhaps is a companion case, and this is probably an avulsion of uh, insertion there. Yep, that piece there. And yeah, I guess we can even see it on radiograph. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, right back there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is really a chronic avulsive injury to the subscramp insertion. Good. Let's just see here. Okay, good. Okay. Why don't we end 
do with this case today? We got a 50-year-old female with uh, three years history of, I'm sorry, with pain, status post surgery three years ago. Um, we have an axial, looks like a PD if I'm not mistaken, or uh, T2, T1, okay. Uh, so we have a surgical um, track at the humeral head and we have a lot of increased signal where the yeah construct fell with scar inside. <laughs> okay. Right. Sure. And here we can see the, the subscap. The subscap repair. But what we see back here is the musculotendinous junction is way back here. There's probably some uh, fatty atrophy here. This is the tendon. That's probably the distal end of the tendon there. This is scar in situ out to here uh, where the r repair site was. But you can see that the musculotendinous junction is markedly retracted here. So uh, again, I've pointed out many, many times here, whenever you, you see these chronic injuries, you have to, you have to go back and, and find the muscular tendinous junction because sometimes the tendon itself, where the tendon ends, which is probably about about here, can be difficult to determine when you have a lot of scar in situ uh, in the healing process. Okay, so why don't we, we stop there and we'll talk a little bit about the biceps tendon and we'll kind of cover all of these seven things that... Uh, 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 Dick Hawkins uh, wanted covered uh, in evaluating rotator cuff tears tomorrow. Okay, any questions? Okay, thank you.